Would you like to learn more about healthy lifestyle choices that will support the overall health of your entire family? Maybe you are a frustrated parent trying to understand how to solve your child's health problems and how to keep them safe during these challenging times. Or maybe you or someone you know is pregnant and would love to ensure a successful pregnancy. Welcome to C60 Health Connections, where we meet with leading experts in the health and wellness space. Today's show couldn't be more timely and more important. We are discussing how to raise healthy kids and healthy families in an increasingly toxic world. The lovely, passionate, and wise Anna Maria Temple, MD, is with us today. Dr. Temple is a holistic pediatrician, best-selling author, and mother of three. She's an award-winning speaker at the Harvard Club of Boston and has had over 100 TV, news, and podcast appearances. Several years ago, she lived and worked in New Zealand, and this is where she started integrating functional medicine into her traditional practice. In her 22-year career, she has treated over 36,000 patients in person and has taught thousands more via her online courses. Her passion is to inspire, educate, and empower parents to revamp their family's health and wellness to ensure that their children avoid developing unnecessary chronic health problems. My name is Jessica McNaughton, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at C60 Purple Power. I'm a business executive with years of experience in corporate America, and for more than 20 years, I've been exploring various modalities in health, wellness, and spirituality. Now, before we get started, any statements, products, or remedies discussed today have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. Any products or topics discussed today are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, prevent, or mitigate any disease. So with that, let's dive right in. Anna Maria, so great to see you. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so excited to be here. This is going to be great. This is going to be so much fun. All right, let's just dive right in. Can you please tell our audience a little bit about your background and why you were so passionate about helping parents ensure that their children enjoy optimal health? Absolutely. Well, my journey actually started, if we're going to go back, actually, I was born in Romania and raised under communism. And in 1984, my parents came to the U.S., That's a whole story in itself. Anyway, my dream had always been to become a doctor. And in 2007, I was a practicing pediatrician and I had three children at the ages two, four, and six. Unfortunately, they were plagued by chronic disease. They had asthma, eczema, allergies, constipation, recurrent ear infections, recurrent croup, uh, severe seasonal allergies that my youngest child could not even go out for an Easter egg hunt because his eyes would swell shut, his body would be covered in hives, and he would have tears streaming down his face. And uh, oh, let's not forget the battle with ADHD. Anyway, so one day I took this three ring circus to the doctor because I wanted to know, I'm like, how can my kids be on this many medications? They were two, four, and six, like I said, this could not be okay. So I went to their pediatrician and they were all lined up on the table, like the little three little ducklings. And, you know, the answers that I got was like, well, Allie, for my six-year-old daughter, they're like, well, for asthma, we'll use it daily. Inhaled steroids will keep her asthma under control. Topical steroids will keep her eczema under control. She will take Zyrtec for seasonal allergies, which will prevent her asthma from uh, acting up and from her eczema flaring and she will outgrow her uh, recurrent ear and infections. She would take some Miralax for a constipation and on and on it went. And then for my little guy, they were like, well, there's just no more medicines that we can give him. He was on five medications at that point. They said, the only next option is allergy shots. He was two years old. And then they were talking about ADHD. And honestly, I stopped listening at that point because my mama, you know, the mama bear took over and was like, what? These kids are destined for lifelong meds and like this can't happen. So mama bear looked at my doctor self and was like, what you got, girl? And my doctor self was like, I got nothing, got nothing. And mama bear was like, no problem, no problem. We're going to figure this out. I don't know how we're going to do it, but this is not the rest of the story for these kids. 
And so, you know, my mindset changed. And a week later, I was, I went to the kid's school where there was a nutritionist giving a talk. And I always go to the talks that the school puts together. And I always walk <laughs> to walk in. I'm like, I'm going to know everything they're going to say. But, you know, I'm just showing up to be supportive. Well, I can tell you that on that Tuesday morning, it's 730 in the morning and the freezing cold first grade classroom huddled in the desk of a first grader. I the fog lifted and I realized and I saw the root cause of my children's chronic disease and all the lady talked about was sugar. And I went home after work that night, about 7.30 at night. I walked in with my stilettos, marched right to the pantry and to the heart of my children and the husband. I threw out all the Lucky Charms and the Pop-Tarts, toaster strudels, cinnamon toast crunch, mac and cheese, um, the chicken nuggets, you name a garbage. We had it and out it went. And that's when the era of isolation began and I became an outcast in my family. My husband and I proceeded to fight over food for the next five years. My friends were like, you've lost, you've lost your mind. And, you know, my family, I think, scratched me off their wills. And, you know, my medical partners were like, where's the evidence for all this? And I was like, I don't know where the evidence for this is because it was 2007. Um, but it can be wrong to get rid of food coloring and artificial flavors and replace them with fruits and vegetables. And so, you know, despite all the naysayers, because, you know, when mama bear takes over, you cannot step a mom or a parent on a mission. When a parent comes on a mission, it's on. And it doesn't matter what anybody else says. And that's what happened. And I just kept going and pushing through with what I knew in my gut and that was going to be the right answer for my children. And over the next five years, okay, I didn't know all this stuff, so it took some time. But over the, over the next five years, my kids stopped needing antibiotics. They stopped needed oral steroids, inhaled steroids. They came off their asthma meds, eczema meds, constipation resolved, ear infections went away, seasonal allergies went away. We never needed allergy shots. My ADHD kid never needed a dose of Ritalin ever. And, you know, over time, I, my uh, family, everyone else around me was asking questions and my practice and my medical practice actually changed. But by 2016, my family and I, we quit our jobs. My husband and I quit our jobs and we moved to New Zealand, like you said, and we had no doctors, no medications, no health insurance, nothing. And my children thrived. They climbed the highest mountains and bungee jumped off the tallest bridges. And I looked at them and I was like, wow. This is what it's like to overcome chronic disease and be able to thrive. So when I practice medicine in New Zealand, there's no malpractice. The hospital, there's no Google reviews. You just practice medicine. And I walked in, I was like, we're going to do this different folks. And then by the time that I came back to the US, I was like, under no circumstances, am I going to practice medicine like I used to, because I have seen too much and I have accomplished so much. And I want other people to benefit from the expertise, from my mistakes, from the things I've learned without having to go through all the heartaches that I went through. Wow. I am I'm so excited about this conversation because you are you are living proof. You have been in the shoes of these parents who were struggling who don't know any better because this information is, you know, it's it's been suppressed um, and it hasn't been talked about in the mainstream. You've gone through it, you've overcome it and you're not just surviving but you actually have evidence about how to thrive in life and how these, they seem like they're tough decisions at first to toss out the sugar and the lucky charms, like you said, and the mac and cheese and all the fun stuff that kids like to eat, including the chicken nuggets, but you got rid of it. And then you, like you reprogram a computer, you reprogrammed your family with healthy lifestyle choices. So I love it. So let's dive in, right? Let's, let's dive into that. Um, what are, what are some of the most basic and important healthy lifestyle choices that parents can make easily starting today that will support their children's health? Well, the 
None of them are easy because it all depends on your mindset. And if okay. I would say probably number one thing is changing the mindset. We walk around and we think that because our kids don't have a lot of colds, they don't have a lot of coughs, you don't see the pediatrician on a regular basis, your kids are healthy. But if your child is suffering from constipation, from asthma, from Crohn's disease, from recurrent belly pains, recurrent headaches, um, all these kind of things, your child is not thriving. They have a chronic illness. So a mind mindset has to change from my kids are, I can't tell how many times I hear, oh, my kids are fine, but they have ADHD or covered in eczema or, and I'm like, they're not fine. And majority of kids these days are not fine. So having the mind and chronic disease begins in childhood and shows up in adulthood. So let's say your child is doing amazing. They have no issues when they're going to be 30, 40 years old, and they end up having a heart attack, or they're having anxiety, or they're having horrible stomach issues, et cetera. It's because of all the things that were occurring throughout their whole life that culminated in the illness that is diagnosed at 30 and 40. So a lot of times I hear people go, the kids are fine. It's fine. It's not a big deal. You're totally ridiculous. Of course they can have cereal because they're healthy. So a healthy kids can just eat all this stuff. And I'm like, well, no, this, this adds up. The body keeps count. And the body keeps counting and it shows the result sometimes at 10 years old, sometimes 17, sometimes 20, sometimes 40. Um, So mindset that we need to make changes now. And I'm all about replacement rather than elimination. When we tell kids you could never have Chick-fil-A, you could never have a Dorito. Well, that's the only thing they're going to whine and cry about. So with the way I started with my kids, I was like, all right, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill their bellies with fruits and vegetables and then not say no to the lucky charms. I mean, it sounds really great in the story, but that's not how it really went. It's just the story is much better when I say that I chucked everything. I really didn't. I stopped, brought it in fruit smoothies and I created fruit smoothies in the morning. They would have to drink the smoothie before they could eat their Lucky Charms. And over time, what happened is they, the smoothie got bigger and their portion size for Lucky Charms got smaller. And then we got to the point where they were not even asking for it and it would just sit in the pantry for weeks to months on end. And then eventually I just stopped buying it. So start replacing. An, truly an easy thing though is to give your child a grape at breakfast, a carrot slice at lunch, one piece of broccoli at dinner. The biggest you know, complaint I get, oh, kids don't want to eat their picky. They don't, right. Well, we're not going to present them with a bowl of fruits and a bowl of salad, because if you're already against eating a lot of plants, you're not going to want a whole bowl. But all of us eat with our eyes first and you can tolerate a half of a grape or one grape and also develops the habit before we put anything else in our body, we're going to eat a plant. You do not need to be vegan. This is not a plant. This is not a plant-based diet. This is just, let's bring more plants into our diet. Second thing, we're going to get our children outside to move. It's not like they can never be on screen time, but it's going to be for every minute you're outside. That's how many minutes of screen time you get. Now the children are empowered, they're in charge of their activity and they're in charge of how desperately they want to do screen time. So you're not saying no, you're saying, of course you can have screen time, depending on how many minutes you play outside today. For sleep, you know, a lot of the teens and kids, they want iPads and they want to watch a show. And you, a lot of the routines I hear is like, oh, we have dinner and then we have a game and everybody watches a show and then the kids go to bed. Well, I'm not saying don't watch a show ever. How about we do it before dinner time? So many studies and so many times in clinic, I see sleep disturbances because the shows are being watched after dinner and too close to bedtime, which triggers nightmares, night terrors, night waking, and coming into the parental bed to to snuggle in there. So again, let's replace it make it earlier in the day. And then at home, as you're going through your journey, you're going to start replacing some of the toxins in your life. You're not going to start with, let's get rid of all the cleaners, the makeup, the soaps, the detergents and stuff. Just start with one thing, you know, and in my book, um, Healthy Kids in an Unhealthy World, I give actually outline our journey for 14 years and how we started out with like the Vitamix blender and fruits at breakfast. And then we tackled, you know, vacation lunches. And then we tackled uh, water filtration, but it wasn't all in one year. It was over 14 years. So the last tip is one step at a time. You don't have to do it all in one day because in order to, you know, run a marathon, you have to practice. And it all begins with one step. You don't run 24 miles, just getting out of bed. 
Amen. <clears throat> All right. That's good. All right. So you, I know one of the things that you've really di dialed in and have helped parents with is um, dealing with chronic skin issues. So I want to talk about that. Um, can you help us understand why are we seeing an increase in eczema and other chronic skin conditions in children? Oh my gosh. The rates of eczema are through the roof. And because two of my children dealt with eczema, even my dog had eczema issues. Um, it just became my passion so I can help other families uh, overcome this debilitating and devastating conditions. The, there's so many reasons that we're seeing a rise in eczema is going to be the processed foods our children have, the amount of sugar in the diet, the rates of C-section, the amount of Tylenol children are given, the anti-reflux medications, the antibiotics, the amount of stress, the amount of pollution. I mean, I can go on and on and it's this, it is getting overall worse rather than better. And what I want you guys to think about is how can we have more advances, more medicines, more technology than ever before yet? Here's the thing. We're not living longer. We're dying longer. And we are now the first generation that is not going to outlive our parents. We are sicker than ever before. And our children are paying the price. Wow. Wow. All right. So like, why, why is it so hard for traditional doctors to diagnose and treat these conditions properly? Like you were, you were in that world and you had to leave and, and move over to the functional medicine side. So can you just kind of break down for those of us who haven't gone to medical school, like what's going on here? Right. Well, you know, we do in medical school, your the training is, you know, diagnosis. Like you are trained like this is cancer, what kind of cancer? This is eczema, this is psoriasis, this is seasonal allergies, this is a cold. And then for every one of those, there's a medication treatment option. And that is how medical school goes. And yes, you're told that a healthy, you know, they should have a healthy diet. Yes, you're told that patients should move, but nobody in my medical school career that I know has taught us how to teach that because knowing that you should eat a healthy diet, whatever that means, is not the same as doing it. And families need support in learning how to do it. It's, and we don't, we were not taught that in med school. Also, when you're in the traditional practice, I used to have 10 minute visits that were dictated by the hospital. So I would have to Somebody would come in and let's say that if we're ADHD, I would get 20 minutes because that was really generous. In 20 minutes, I had to evaluate if the child had ADHD, answer all the parents' concerns, dig into their diet, their sleep, their stress, their school, all the different things. And then I would have to coach them into how to begin the changes. It is not possible in a 20-minute visit to get all that done. Not to mention that a lot of parents fought back. They were like, I want medicine. And I was like, no, you need to stop eating Skittles. And they're like, we don't want to eat Skittles. So then it becomes this whole thing. But part of the problem is because the hospital and the suits dictate how doctors should practice medicine. You know, a lot of doctors just take a beating. They're like, oh, they don't. When you have a 10 minute visit and you have a waiting room full of patients and you're 45 minutes behind and you know, at the end of the day, you're going to have three hours of charting to do when a patient comes in and is like, Hey doc, what do you think about um, echinacea as for my immune system um, in the light of the cold that I have? You literally start bleeding from the eyes because you're not, not because you're mean, because all you can see in the back of your head is that clock ticking and your work never ending. Is this okay? Under no circumstances. But when I transition to my integrative thing of wellness, the way I do practice medicine now, a lot of folks are like, well, what do you do? And I was like, I talk about nutrition. They're like, well, so do we. I'm like, eh. I have our appointments. I have health coaches. I have an entire team that I deploy to my family so we can dig into this stuff. That's why my, uh, the kids in my practice who have ADHD don't need to be on medicines most of the time. That's why we treat anxiety without medications because I have the time, the team, and the support. And also in the doctor's defense, the insurance companies, because you can say, well, okay, well, why don't you as a doctor have an hour appointment in traditional practice? The insurance will pay a pediatrician $25 for an hour visit that consists of nutrition education. Shame on our society. Again, 
So for a doctor to be able to make the income, right, you have to see 10 patients in an hour, 10 times 25. So you can start being, you know, all the overhead and everything else. But I'm just, there's, it's so complicated, intricate. It, it, the doctors are just pawns in a system that is so incredibly corrupted. Oh, uh, ay, ay, ay. Okay. I, th- I really appreciate you breaking down like what, what the problem is because uh, a lot of people just don't know. Like they, they literally believe that when they're given that 10 minute appointment that whatever was said there in the protocol and like you said, there's been a diagnosis. Now here's a, um, a, a medical, you know, a medicine that's, that's being advised to be given. You're literally just slapping a Band-Aid on top of the issue and you're not, you're not really going to get get underneath the issue and unwind it number one because there's time constraint there's a budget constraint there's you know financial pressure for i need to be profitable and if i spend more than these 10 minutes with you i'm not profitable plus i've got my pile of work at the end of the day and all that kind of other stuff um wow all right so we're not going to get into the system issues because we can't do anything about that today and today's context is about choices that you can make to support your life to get through this all right so um hopefully you guys kind of understand at this point the underlying current about like why the traditional system isn't working. So let's talk about what we can do in the next step. So um, I'm curious about detox because it sounds like to me based on the journey that you shared that you, you kind of in a, in a you know, it took a, a process of time, but you took your family on basically like a detox journey. I'm, I'm curious if you think detox for families and children is important. And if so, like how do you begin? I think detox is important. And here's the thing. I think detox is important more than just in January. I think we need to be detoxing our bodies every single day. And I know a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, what are we giving the children every day? Broccoli and cauliflower. Broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts. And the people are going to be like, what are you talking about? These three types of vegetables are high in sulfur, which make your body make glutathione. Glutathione is a powerful antioxidant that helps detox your body. When we eat a lot of vegetables, meats, and foods that are not don't have any sugar in them, the liver has to break down fat cells in order to access the sugar in the fat cells. And when it breaks down the fat cell, is it, it is able to eliminate heavy metals, any toxins you come in contact with, and basically detoxing. So the liver is one of our organs for detox. So is our skin. That's why it's important to sweat every single day. Sitting on the couch playing an iPad is not detoxing your child. That is just cluttering their brains with all the other stuff. So we need to move and sweat every single day so we can detox through our biggest organ in our body, our skin. We have to drink a lot of water. A lot of people reach for all the juices and the cleanses. Y'all, water's free. Water. Okay. I mean, I prefer filtered water if we can. What's your what's your secret to getting kids to drink it? Because, you know, a lot of kids, especially if parents have been uh, leaning on, man, just have some juice, you know, because they just want their kid to drink something. How, how do you help support those parents who are dealing with kids who are like, I don't want to, I don't want to drink it. Those happen to be my children who had juice boxes <laughs> and, and chocolate milk in their lunch boxes every day. So that was me. I got you. What we you can do, one, is every, you know, you can reduce the juice boxes to every other day in the lunchbox for several weeks, then is like two times a week, then once a week, then they go away. For other children, you can start diluting the juice instead, you know, when you get a giant thing of juice at home, um, keep the bottle. And when you finish that, you're going to fill the next bottle with, let's say, let's say the bottle is 20 ounces is going to be 19 ounces of juice and one ounce of water. And that's going to be the juice for the week. And then the next week is going to be 18 ounces of juice and two ounces of water. Over time, diluting the juice is going to change your children's taste buds and they're going to be more accepting of water and they're not, they're going to be more intolerant of the really sweet juice. Our taste buds die every 90, excuse me, every 30 days, a third of our taste buds are every 30 days. So in 90 days, you have all new taste buds. So just like you train for that old marathon we're talking about, that's how we train taste buds. So it's not like the taste that you have today are going to be the taste that you have six months from now. Under no circumstances, your taste buds depend on the food you eat. So if you only eat sugar, 
you're not going to eat broccoli. But if you slowly decrease the sugar and replace it with a little more broccoli each day, all of a sudden, lo and behold, in a few months, you're able to tolerate water and broccoli. That is so cool. I did not know that about taste buds. Like that's that's really encouraging news for parents. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit more about nutrition. A lot of parents, this is a staple. I grew up with this, in fact. A lot of parents think that um, feeding their kids milk and cereal every morning is healthy. You mentioned the Lucky Charms. But maybe some people are, are feeding their kids uh, Cheerios or Chex or, you know, you, like you think you're making a, a lower sugar choice um, and you're giving your kids milk and cereal and that's, that's your standard protocol. D- do you agree that that's a healthy choice? And if not, why? totally disagree. And it is a food of convenience and everybody, because when I go after foods, it can be so on Instagram. I'm known as the fun police. Cause I You're go after, police. I am the fun police. Ooh. I go after like all that people <laughs> eat. And so the thing, it's a convenient thing poor cereal, poor milk. And then yes, my parents are like, well, we buy this. And I'm like, well, it's sweetened with monk fruits, sweetened with stevia folks. That's still sugar. We don't have time to go into that bowl and another time, but this is a processed food that we're putting in our children's bodies that is not providing them with fat, protein, antioxidants, all the powerful things they need for an amazing brain that's supposed to learn all day. We're giving them, I'm sorry, garbage in a bowl. And then we're expecting them to behave, to pay attention, to focus and concentrate. When it comes to cereals, if you were like, but I need a cereal. Well, let's say you do a cereal that has no added or two grams of added sugar. Okay, on it, your children will have to add berries and fruits. And then maybe you're going to add sprinkle seeds like flaxseed and chia seeds. And maybe you're going to put some spices like cinnamon and clove because what those are going to do, all those things are very powerful for the system. And if you're willing to make that cereal a powerful breakfast, I don't have a problem with it, but most people are like cereal poor and poor milk. An easy swap is actually smoothies. You can make a smoothie. You can have pre-packed bags. In fact, at Costco, they already have, and Costco's not paying me for anything. I'm just saying. They should. We're just just helping you guys figure out how to do this affordably. Right. And so there, so I go on my videos to Costco. I do shopping trips and I show everybody the money. The the, uh, smoothie packs that they have at Costco, it's $1.75 a pack that you can, all you have to do is you can put a milk base or you can put water base, throw the, the smoothie pack in there, blend it. It will take you 30 seconds. So it saves money, time, and your child's brain. And if after that, they still want to do their cereal, great. Most kids are like super happy to get their smoothie and go. And yes, you have to figure out how sweet they want it and what they want into it. Right. It's going to be a learning process and it's okay. Awesome. Okay. What are, I'm just curious, what are some of the health issues that you're seeing occur in children who are fed a diet that's heavy in dairy, wheat with gluten and sugar? What are some of the, the biggest issues that are, that are showing up right now? Eczema, constipation, asthma, recurrent ear infections, anxiety, belly pain. Did I say constipation? Yeah, constipation. Um, Headaches. Those would be the top ones that I see related to this. What about for um, parents who are curious about kind of what's going on with their kids' bodies? If if they've got a normal weighted child, but the child starts to get a protruding belly, you know, kind of like a round basketball shape, what, what are some of the things that may be going on? And I recognize you're not, this is a general comment. It's, it's not a diagnosis. Totally. Um, one of the things that my first question is going to be uh, their bowel movements. So speaking of detox, another thing that has to happen every single day is children have to poop every day. The colon is one of the major detox organs. If you're not pooping every day, your child is not pooping every day, they're not detoxing and their belly is going to get really poofy. And when I say pooping, it's not a pebble. We're talking a long brown snake that is easy to pass. Sorry, my friends, but everyone is like, oh, we don't want to talk about it. I'm like, oh, it's one of the let's most important bodily functions, um, right? Let's put a long brown snake as a pop-up here. Thank you. 
It is. Uh, so on the Bristol stool chart is a type four. And that shows us that the body is working properly. So number one, what is the stool pattern? A lot of the kids with that belly issue you're talking about are constipated. They're not pooping. They're not eliminating. They're not detoxing. Then we have the kids that just have poor digestion. Let's say that they're pooping, but their belly is still big. So in the morning, they wake up with a flat belly. By after breakfast, after lunch, their belly gets bigger than flat than big. That speaks to abnormal digestion. In our body, we have digestive enzymes starting with our saliva in our stomach, past the liver and the pancreas in the small intestine. And sometimes due to different lifestyle factors, genetics, diet, stress, lack of movement, et cetera, we have a decrease in our digestive enzymes, which then prevent the good food coming in from being absorbed into the body. So when the food is not absorbed, it sits in the colon, the bacteria tries to break it down, which causes fermentation, which causes a whole bunch of gas bubbles. And now the, the child's belly is giant. Ouch. All right. So you talked about the constipation issues. Um, I, I, I understand that that can impact children's mood and their ability to focus in school. Um, you've talked a little bit, you know, about, you know, make sure that number one, that you're eating broccoli, cauliflower and Brussels sprouts every day and you're increasing your water and you're exercising, you're sweating every day. Um, what are some other suggestions for parents to do to help their kids experience regular bowel movements and pooping every day? <clears throat> oh, I got you. Well, the challenge that we actually did on Instagram in January is called plant point challenge. And in the a plant point challenge, plant point and challenge. Okay. Plant point challenge. And let me tell you the amount of people that have jumped in. I have kids who are super picky kids who didn't want to eat this, didn't want to eat that, but because it's a challenge, because in the houses, there's a chart that comes with it that is divided in 30 days. You just print out a calendar, piece of calendar paper. It's not a big deal. And on it every day, your child has to get 13 plan points and you can make it a challenge of between the siblings, between the family who can't use more plants. I know I sound like I'm a vegan. I, it's not. It's all about increasing the variety of plants in your diet, which will in turn improve your gut microbiome and digestion, which in turn is going to make you have awesome poops, which in turn is going to help your memory focus concentration and clear up your skin. Mm. In the plant point challenge, all you have to do is you just have to eat one grape. So one grape is one point. If you eat an entire bowl of grapes, it's still one point. And what has happened is that my parents were like, okay, well, at breakfast, I usually give my kids strawberries. Well, because we're in the plant point challenge, I started thinking, hmm, if I only give them strawberries, that's one point, but maybe I'll do strawberries, blueberries, and blackberries. And the kids, majority of them are happily eating it, even if they don't like it, because they want a point on that chart that is sitting on the fridge. And then for lunch, they're like, well, usually I pack red peppers, which is the way I pack my talks lunch too sometimes. And I was like, oh, well, now you can do orange peppers, yellow peppers, red peppers, maybe some green peppers. Now you've gotten four plant points in that one container because the variety trumps quantity. And with a variety, not only are we going to have awesome poops, but it's going to start working and dealing with your child's other issues that may be occurring. So um, can constipation contribute to anxiety? 100%. We have a direct in our eczema program. I can't tell you many patients are like, oh my gosh, well, we're not making progress. And I'm like, what's the poop like? And they're like, oh, they're still pooping every third day. I'm like, we're never going to clear the eczema if the poop is not moving. And then, you know, the same person two weeks later on our Facebook live will come in and they're like, oh my gosh, we're pooping every day. And the skin is cleared up. I'm like, oh, it's a miracle. And then they get constipated <laughs> and the eczema flares. And I'm like, oh my God. And, you know, and it's, but the amount of times that this happens and we see it over and over again, you know, people are like, oh my God, the gut really does impact the skin and the brain and your lungs and your kidneys, you know, your heart, because it's all together. All together. Yeah. That makes so much sense. Um, I love your plan too uh, for the for the challenge, and I love that you're getting points for the variety. It's not just the quantity; it's the different types. So you're really kind of helping set the foundation for children to not only embrace but enjoy these different fruits and vegetables. So that sounds really awesome. Um, what's your uh, Instagram handle? Uh, so we'll, we'll pop it up here so people can join. Sure, at D R A N A Maria Temple. There we go. That's easy. You go talk to the fun police. 
Yeah. At, uh, <laughs> Dr. Anna Maria Temple. <laughs> She's there. She is always. <laughs> She's seeing, waiting for you. Waiting um, to see right. how you can crush things. Yes. We know uh, childhood obesity obesity is on the rise. What are some of your th- best practices that you recommend for parents who want to help their kids enjoy a healthy weight throughout their childhood? Oh my gosh. You know, this pandemic business has now doubled our obesity rates. It has doubled our rates of diabetes. It has been, uh, for our children, has been a devastating thing that has happened um, with the things we put in place. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about obesity. And what's happened is that we can change our children's diet and trajectory without changing our own. So if you want your children to eat less sugar, you have to eat less sugar. If you want them to eat vegetables and fruits, you have to eat vegetables and fruits. If you want them to move, yep, your bum's got to be outside doing the same thing. If you want them to put their screens down so they get more exercise, you've got to put your phone down and you have to get exercise. A lot of parents are like, my gosh, I work so much. I work a million jobs. I'm so tired. I'm exhausted. I'm paying the bills. I'm paying taxes. I just want to enjoy cookies. And I sit on the couch and relax. I'm with you. Me too. But our job as parents is not done. And it is a job. We have to work at it every single day. Is it fair? Well, I don't know. I mean, we elect to be parents. So, I mean, I have, you know, it's a little struggle in that, but, and I'm not, you know, a lot of times I'm not, I'm not fuss. I'm not a soft and fuzzy kind of person. I'm kind of like, this is how it is. And we got to do it. If you're going to be serious about your child's wellness, you got to do it. What I show you all the time on Insta is the behind the scenes. My booty is in that gym, you know, which I've now created my garage because I don't want to go to the YMCA. But anyway, um, I, I come from work after working, you know, till 530 at night. And while my food is cooking in the Instapot, I am working out in the garage. We get, I give you tons of recipes on how to do it because it's also really hard. So the way that we're going to overcome it is, again, mindset that this is so super important and that we, the parents, have to be the leaders. We have to be the adults we want our children to become. You cannot sit on the couch and point fingers and tell them to do stuff that you're not willing to do. We have to also get over the mindset that healthy food is disgusting. I cannot tell you how many times I hear like, well, we can't eat healthy because just saying healthy, it's gross. That is a a mindset issue that we have put, our culture has taken over. And, you know, I have my, one of my nephews is like, oh, well, if I see, I know that you're bringing food over. I know it's healthy. I'm not even going to eat it because it's going to be gross without even tasting it. The mind will tell your taste buds if you're going to have it acceptable or not. They have so many awesome studies. If you have time to Google, Google the milkshake study where the mindset was able to change the blood levels of hormones when patients were given different, the same food, but were told was different food and the body reacted differently based on what they were told. The mind is incredibly powerful. And we've, we've become a sedentary society. We just sit around all the time. Do you, I don't know if you guys remember, but when a lot of you were little, I was little in 48. So when I was little, um, we would like go outside. It was just the thing, right? You don't have an iPad. You had like one channel. Okay, maybe you had a couple of channels, but there was nothing on TV except infomercials. And then after lunch, you would go outside and you would not come inside till dinner time. And in fact, a lot of us were got in trouble because we were late for dinner. Nobody came in because I need snacks, because I need to watch TV. It was just like, see ya, close the door, bye, and you were never in. And now to get a child to go outside, you're like bleeding from the eyes. I really enjoy that thing. And then you have to (laughs) rip them out of the house and you have to rip the electronics out of their hands and you have to give them consequences if they don't go outside. It is exhausting. And when you're a tired parent that's working so hard, you, a lot of us take the path of least resistance, which is them sitting on a couch or in their room, which is contributing to this whole thing. And another thing that's exhausting, the parents are like, okay, well, I'm working and I have to come home and cook and I have to work out after what this lady's talking about. How am I going to do all this? Well, I'm going to give you a shortcut. You have created these small humans in your house. They are capable. They are not guests. They don't come. I mean, I, we cater to them like this is a hotel. Oh my gosh. Oh, did you go to school? Oh, do you have a long day? Okay. You can sit on your games for the next three hours. What? No, you can chop a vegetable. You can wash a dish. You can take the dog out. 
You can feed the dog. So delegating responsibility to the small humans in your house. And yes, even if they're four years old, in my book, I outline set of chores that are need to be put in place. Children get a sense of belonging, a sense of responsibility, a sense of being part of the family, contributing. They'll eat more vegetables, move more when they are put in charge of stuff rather than cater to as hotel guests. <laughs> They don't need to be hotel guests. <laughs> I'm so frustrated. I will come home from work and everyone is like, I, I have all this homework to do. They were messing around on Snapchat or inside. They did not have all this homework to do. And then I'm like, I don't know. I don't really care how much homework you have to do. You can do some dishes. It's going to take you 10 minutes. If you would stop whining, you know, for 30 minutes, it will take you 10 minutes to just get the dishes done. Mama bear is here. <laughs> Boys and girls. I told you I'm not soft and fluffy. <laughs> I love it. Okay. <clears throat> I know you're passionate about helping parents save money while making these healthy choices. So can we talk a little bit about budgeting and finance now? Um, I'm curious about some best recommendations that you have for how busy parents who are short on time and money can make healthy choices at the grocery store and manage a tight and tightening food budget. Oh, yeah. And, and you know what? The food budget issue is getting worse because yeah. inflation has increased the prices of food. So now it's getting more ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. Um, going to the store, right? So one of the things that I, um, I do is I spend all my weekends doing videos at different stores to show you all the different ways that you can save money. Because yes, you can buy organic and you can buy good food without breaking the bank. The biggest mistake people do is they continue their current shopping and then they add the healthy foods, shall we say, instead of, no, we're going to replace, we're going to not buy the Doritos and we're going to buy apples. We're not going to buy soda. We're going to buy blueberries. We're not going to. And so they're the replacement. Again, you don't have to do it the next shopping trip, the whole basket, but start thinking about it, that we're going to start swapping out the nasties for the good stuff. A lot of people and a lot of children specifically eat a very high carb diet, crackers, pasta, waffles, pizza, um, you know, all beige-ish, nutrient-poor foods. So they're hungry all the time, which then it seems like, oh, how am I going to feed this hungry kid with this expensive food? If you were to take a piece of bread and do nut butter on it with sliced strawberries, they would be more satisfied and they would be less hungry over the next three hours than if they just had a bowl of popcorn, which may seem that it's cheap. But it's then they're going to eat the crackers and the other thing and the other thing. Um, if you were going to make pasta at night, a simple swap instead of buying regular pasta, buy lentil pasta. Regular pasta is two grams of protein, maybe a gram of fiber. Lentil pasta, 21 grams of protein, which wow. and eight grams of fiber, which is ink. I'm sorry, four grams of fiber, which is incredible. So you just swap pasta for pasta. You can keep the same sauce, but again, just with a simple swap, we can now increase their caloric density. And then you can eat on a budget, on a better budget. The other beans, lentils, those are powerful foods and you can buy those dried. Yes. You're going to have to soak them. Yes. You're going to have to cook them in the Instant Pot, but beans are a powerhouse that is equal in protein. Again, I'm going to sound like I'm trying to make you plant-based, but meat prices have become so high that we need to start substituting. And here's the thing, eat meat, it's fine, but we don't need to eat meat three times a day. It is an American thing that we meet three times a day. By the way, in the 1950s, people ate meat two times a week. Nobody called them vegan. Nobody said anything. It was just the thing because people could not afford the price of meat. And over the past 70 years, the way we raise cattle has become horrendous in order to bring cheap meat. The way we raise chickens has become horrendous. So we can bring you cheap chickens and this cheap meat. Now we use it. Oh, I need bacon at breakfast and I need sausages at lunch. And then I need my burgers at dinner. And if there's not a meat in my plate, then I'm not And it. Again, this is the mindset that our culture has set for us. Oh my gosh. If my boys don't eat meat, they're not going to grow. Oh my people haven't eaten this much meat for centuries and they had tall humans. So it's not like this is this. Anyway, back to the mindset. So looking for protein rich foods, going to bulk discount stores, 
also when you buy frozen fruit, cheaper than fresh fruit, if you buy a lot of times we waste stuff. So you're like, oh, well, I can go to Costco to get the spinach because it's like three of us and we're not going to eat that whole thing of spinach, which is $4.99, by the way. And so what I do is, well, eat the spinach that you can over the next few days and you can freeze the rest. You can oh, buy brilliant. the mushrooms <clears throat> yeah, and then you throw yeah, it in Yeah, because you get smoothie. those big tubs and you get through half of it, but then you let it sit there for another week and it it falls apart because of the moisture. Okay. And now you're throwing just freeze money it. in the trash. Right. Freeze it. Like after Perfect. four days, you freeze it. Mushrooms. I get the mushroom, the organic mushrooms from Costco. I use it in my recipe tonight. Everything else gets in a baggie and the freezer and I'll use it in my recipes for the next few weeks. The same thing with majority of the vegetables. You can freeze all the stuff. The amount of stuff I freeze, guys, is like incredible. You can even freeze eggs, by the way. Just letting you know. And Whole cold eggs cuts. Or cooked eggs. The, after you, co- you cooked them, cooked eggs. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Cold, <clears throat> cold cuts. You can do the same thing. You go to Costco and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm getting this turkey breast. And how am I going to get through all that? Just use one pack, freeze the other and defrost it like next week when you're ready to use it. Brilliant. Really great tips. Thank you. All right. Um, I don't want to get into uh, our personal opinions about this. I just want to talk about like the biological issue about what's happening. Okay. And because I'd really like your feedback. Um, A lot of parents have been quick to like uh, jump on the the bandwagon about masking kids. Um, And I want to talk, I want people to understand what's actually happening when you're taking away your ability to inhale and exhale freely. Can you give us a little bit of education on what's happening to to children's health with um, mask use? Well, the masks have been so difficult. It's been quite a difficult and challenging situation because we want the kids to be in school. And that was the thing that we can do. Um, What I'm seeing a lot of is um, just kids are having a tough time understanding how to make friends on the playground. If they're having to be masked on the playground, they're having a tough time um, understanding their teacher's requests because they're having difficulty uh, seeing the facial expressions. A lot of kids are doing fine. But a lot of kids, not just a few, a lot of kids are not doing well and they're struggling making social connections and making social interactions. Um, I have so many kids afraid of taking their masks off. And I see that in my clinic when you take your mask off so we can do whatever. And then they're immediately, they're just like, how come no one's wearing a mask? I'm putting a mask on. And, you know, they are, and, you know, you ask them, are you worried about Oh, the viral illness is going around and they're like, oh, no, 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 but I got to put my mask on. And so, you know, when we were younger, it was like, oh, don't give me cooties. I hope. And now we've taught kids that everyone has cooties and we put masks on them. And so I am very concerned about the psychological well-being of a lot of children um, that have gone through this time. I think some kids are not going to be able to recover from this. Oh, that's tough. All right. Um, you also had mentioned earlier at the beginning of your your story when you're sharing your background that you and your husband went through five years of food fighting, <laughs> arm wrestling over these changes that you felt really passionate about making. Um, so I'm wondering if you might be willing to share a little bit with us about kind of best practices for navigating with a partner or maybe even potentially with somebody that you're just co-parenting with, um, you know, how, how were you able, you and your husband able to overcome and successfully navigate these changes as they were being implemented? It was a beast, you know, <laughs> it was, I mean, it was not easy. We, yeah, we had some rocking fights and, you know, he was like, I don't understand. The and I was like, okay, well, listen, that's why I didn't remove. I, that's why I was let's replace. Okay. Well, so he was totally game for making smoothies. You know, he was like, okay, we can make smoothies, but I didn't take away the cereal. So, cause if I would have taken those, throw the cereal in the trash, he would have freaked out, but he started. So we did smoothies. He started changing his diet very subtly, but wouldn't let go. And we would have some discussions. Like um, he bought, he bought some expensive car because whatever. And he's buying the car and he's like researching the fuel and researching the chamois and the car could have to have only the best things that will go on it or in it. And I'm like, what about our kids? I was like, what, what's going on here? This totally doesn't even make sense. Anyway, 
really the turning point for him was when he was having a lot of joint pains and not not feeling well. And then for some reason, he didn't have his, he used to eat cereal every night, like three bowls of cereal, honey nut Cheerios with, no honey nut Cheerios, uh, honey bunches of oats with almonds. That was his cereal. Three bowls at night, always had stomach issues, always had joint issues. He's an orthopedic surgeon. So he's like, ah, oh, you know, it's just this age, whatever. And he, for some reason we ran out. Anyway, so he had a couple of weeks of no cereal at night. And he was like, my stomach doesn't hurt. And I'm like, oh, you don't say. And then his joints, whatever we were doing, because I'm the one that's cooking. I'm the one that, that was buying the food. He wasn't buying. So he had to eat what was in the house. And as we were making changes, of course, his diet had to change. And he noticed some improvements in it. But as I said, the one way to start is going to be replacements for partners. And especially if it's a wife and a guy and a dad, the dudes, generally speaking, love the bottom line. They need a spreadsheet and they need to see like how this is going to actually affect it. So for my mamas, I'm always like, okay, well, you can outline how many doctor visits you have, how many co-pays, how many labs, the, pay, the price of medications, the price of lotions, the price of X, Y, Z. And then you can do the price of the groceries. And, you know, the, again, dudes speak in the bottom line and no problem. And you got to talk in the bottom line. And because we're going to make these changes, we're going to see a significant reduction in our medical costs. And a guy will understand that and will start becoming on board. My, my men need to see they're not as trusting as women. This is not a, this is not a good or bad. It's just how it is. And they need to see the results almost before they believe it. And I'll have a lot of guys that oh, my husband was an example. He, you know, I'm talking about fruits and vegetables, all this stuff. And then he sends me a picture of his breakfast plate one day, which is beautiful. It's got all these veg, eggs. I mean, it's amazing. And he's like, look at my breakfast. And I was like, oh my God, I was so proud of myself. He listened to me. And then the next thing, you know, the three dots on the text come through. He's like, this was immense health. Isn't it amazing? I'm like, oh. <laughs> like, oh, did men's health say that? Did, did men's health say that? Okay, well, I'm glad they said it. I'm like, well, however you listen. So another suggestion is perhaps that a lot of guys uh, like to listen to podcasts. So kind of doing a, hey, how about I listen to this great podcast, talk about whatever. And, you know, so when they listen to the podcast and it's not you chirping in and it's somebody else saying, just like our kids, our kids want to hear from somebody else too. So for all partners, you know, send a podcast, send an Instagram reel, send an Instagram kind of like, oh my God, wasn't this interesting? Because there's a lot of people that are able to make wellness more entertaining in order to get buy-in from more people. Because yeah, me too. I'm like, now I have to do all these reels. <laughs> to get people to eat vegetables, but whatever, I'll stand on my head and, you know, do the hula hoop with vegetables in my hand to get people with kids to eat more plants. I love it. I love it. So bottom line, if you implement these healthy lifestyle choices, you're going to save money and you're going to feel better, right? hundred percent. And once people feel, start feeling better, they often don't go back because once you see, you can't unsee. All right, Dr. Temple, how do people get in touch with you? Will you and, and, and tell us a little bit about your books. We're gonna we're gonna post all of your um all of the ways to, for people to get in touch with you in our show notes, by the way. So let's let's talk about your your two books first. <laughs> so Woo! Healthy Kids in Non-Healthy World. Here it is. It's amazing. She's fabulous. Um, this is where you're gonna get your parenting tips, how to deal with picky eaters, how to reduce toxins in your environment, how to reduce sugar, how to read food labels, what kind of meat should you buy, what kind of chicken, what, are, what about the eggs, why are kids so annoying, why do they whine so much, oh, I got you right here, oh, also what pans you should cook on and what sunscreen to get, got you. Um, our second book is actually the eczema epidemic, and that's going to be coming out June, so that's not ready, so we're trying to make a little more affordable and give more people resources that are struggle with eczema. And I'd love to have you guys on Instagram where I do so much free teaching. My passion is to educate, inspire, and empower families to do it. And a lot of people want to do DIY and I love it. And that's awesome. So I want to give you the right tools because again, there's a lot of information out there. It's called infobesity. There's too much information. I try to break down the information coming from various sources, put it in quick, succinct, often entertaining ways. So you can do one tidbit. My whole thing is like from all my posts, from the book, from each chapter, it's just one little takeaway, one little step that you can implement today for amazing changes tomorrow. 
also on YouTube. YouTube travel is my name. And I go to Costco, Target and Walmart and do grocery shopping for you. So you don't even think about it. You just sit down, write down what I say and you go to Costco and you just buy it. Just saved you hours of your life. I love it. Okay. So people can find you also on your website, right? DrAnnaMaria.com? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. And I know you've got a couple of transformational programs to help people specifically with eczema. And then also you have a healthy holistic baby program. I sure do. So the, um, my eczema transformation, we take you from terrible skin to fabulous skin with less stress, less worry, more wellness and less medications. And our results have been incredible. Um, and then we have the healthy holistic baby and that we have the prenatal program and our baby manual will be launching in a couple of weeks. We're super excited. We're going to cover colic and teething and baby constipation and cradle cap, you name a baby thing. We're going to be talking about it. Oh, that's so cool. So skin issues, healthy, holistic baby program. You've got great lifestyle tips and, and great family tips on your Instagram, on your YouTube. You're all about helping mamas be ferocious mama bears out there and really protect their kids. And you're helping people navigate through these challenging times and make great choices and, and um, navigate through the info obesity, info, info obesity, info obesity, info obesity. Got it. All right. Um, it has been such a pleasure to speak with you today, Anna Maria. Thank you so much for your time. Um, really look forward to having you back again in the future. I want I want to dive in more into uh, the eczema and the um, healthy, holistic baby topics as well. Um, really appreciate you and the great work that you're doing. Thank you for, um, for everything that you're doing for all of us. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much, Jess. Thank you. Look forward to speaking to you next time. Thank you for having me on. Thanks.